sang this song to me There was a message in his melody Sweetest lyrics that I ever heard There's a message in the songs of birds Tomorrow is another day Living is the only way Tomorrow's gonna ever come Listen to the words of the song Everything gonna be Everything is gonna be Good evening to anyone and everyone who's watching this particular episode of A Sip of Inspiration. This episode is one of the favorites that we like to actually give you at least once or twice a year on A Sip of Inspiration. And especially we thought it would be a great idea in the midst of the pandemic. The title of this show, of course, is Shatter the Silence and Stop the Violence. So if you need to call a friend or chat them or send them an email so that they can join the Facebook Live page, uh, please take this time to do that now. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, known as the Empowerment Doctor, and I'm the host of this show tonight, which is a sip of inspiration, Shatter the Silence and Stop the Violence. I'm the author of my late, the latest book, is Creating a Masterpiece from a Master Mess. And joining me for this conversation about violence is someone who is not only is a counselor and works with people as a mental health advocate, she also has experienced it herself. And she too, like mother, like others, was surprised when they found that when she found herself like all others in this situation. So this conversation is going to be the, one of the best yet. So I want to welcome you, Ms. Richardson, to our show today. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell others something about you. Uh, on this show, we do try to bring programming that will help people change their lives. And this is one of the things that's happening in our community that I think all too often and just across the races and across the, the sexes, it just doesn't matter. It used to be the face of women, now it's women and men and children. And I think it's something that we just cannot talk enough about. So welcome and let's get started. Tell us, how did you get into this and who are you and where are you located and all that good stuff? Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for having me. I appreciate it. So my name is Tamori Richardson and I live in Northern California, Vacaville, California. I'm a professional motivational speaker, a communications consultant, a coach, a mental health advocate certified, as well as an author. So um, mental health advocacy definitely became my passion, removing myself from an abusive uh, situation with someone who was diagnosed with severe mental illness. So I think it's important that we get as much information out there to as many people as we need to. to to make sure that they get their, their feet in the right direction. Fantastic. So you're in California, you mentioned, right? That's that correct, is, yeah. That's fantastic. So it's at least warm there, right? <laughs> you know, it is warm today. It is warm today. Warm today. Okay. <laughs> it's not too bad over here either. I have a friend in California that always reminds me, uh, welcome to sunny California. So in sunny California, so the term of domestic violence, when we think about that, we think about it in terms of the actual physical act, the actual physical abuse. But it's my understanding over the years that it, it starts long before that. So could you tell us what some of the clues are and how do you know that you are even in an, in an abusive relationship? Absolutely. One of the biggest misconceptions is that domestic violence is only about the initial contact of hitting. It isn't because that's not where it starts. It starts with the emotional. It starts with the verbal. So before the person gets to a place where they ever put their hands on you, you are being diminished. You are being talked down to. You are uh, emotionally being toyed with, whether it's um, infidelities that are being you tranced around in front of you. There's a lot of things that take place that encompass the word domestic violence before you are even struck with the first hand. You are already in the midst of it. You just don't even know it yet. Wow. So what is the textbook definition of domestic violence? Well, domestic violence is when you are, the number one, domestic comes from the form, the place of where it has been 
uh, a spouse or two individuals that live together in a domestic type of a situation. And the initial domestic violence was based on hitting. It wasn't until later that we realized that uh, women, mostly in domestic violence situations, were um, dealing with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from the trauma of the arguments, the aggression, the verbal abuse, the mental abuse. So it comes from the domestic situation, the live-in situation, because you can have a situation with a friend that doesn't live with you that could be comparable. It's not considered domestic violence. It has to be someone within that domicile, which makes it a domestic violence situation. And as we now know, it's more than just hitting. So give us an example of something that happens, as my mother would say, that has red flags all over it and you should leave now. What would that be? Uh, because if you come from a relationship or even environment where you haven't experienced those things, a lot of times do you find that people just sort of explain them away? Well, you know, I didn't come from domestic violence. I had not even had a bad relationship <laughs> when this jam walked into my life, right? And so when I think about it now, there were so many red flags I could have painted the world red. But I think uh, wanting to argue all the time or turning nothing into something, needing always to be right. Now, these are not, oh, well, my person does that, it's domestic violence. No, but you have to watch the buildup, the transgression of the conversations and um, the emotional uh, abuse of, of hanging out, not caring about your feelings, uh, you know, being around women, not caring what that's doing to you, emotional, things of that nature. Someone that's only in it for themselves that has kind of tendencies of narcissism, if you will. Those are a lot of red flags that as women, we look at and think, oh, well, that's nothing. Or he'll change that once he gets into a relationship with me. Or I can, no, you can do nothing with it. He will do it. And once you allow it, he will now get worse or she will now get worse. That's what will happen. So what resources are available to victims, to people who, because I know that there's some people who are listening to this or will see this later, who will recognize that they are in a domestic violent situation. What resources are available to them? Well, always, if you are in a domestic violence situation and someone is putting their hands on you, you always have the first immediate resources, 911. I know we live in a day and age, especially being people of color, and we're always, always cognizant of the race, racial aspect of it. And that's something we have to be. But if your spouse is putting their hands on you, now is not a time to think about the uh, social um, equitable issue. If you need to call 911, you call 911 and you let the police handle that. Um, you also have the domestic violence. There's a national hotline. And um, for anyone that's listening, it's 800-799-SAFE, which breaks out into 7233. And they're available 24 hours a day. Uh, again, that's 800-799-SAFE. And you can contact them. I'm a certified presenter and speaker for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And um, that's NAMI.org. Um, NAMI has an assortment of different um, services. And although domestic violence is it's in there, it's not a specific, we know that domestic violence also brings on an assortment of mental illnesses. So they are cousins, if you will. And so definitely we like to um, you know, make, make sure that you have those resources. But if you're in a situation where you are being abused, you call 911 and, and, and seek out counseling, absolutely. So at the very beginning what are, of a relationship, what are some of the potential warning signs? You know what, let me say, let me speak for me. I, re I remember one day before we were, we were married and we were having a conversation and he had given me his word he was going to do something and he had not done it. And so when I called him on it and I asked him, well, I thought you were going to do this today. He literally started screaming and yelling and hung the phone up in my face. Now to someone who's alert, I should <laughs> laugh. That should have been seven flags all right then and there. Okay, just that one out to seven that flags. Been seven. Yeah, okay. now that we passed five flags. That was seven of them right there. Um, and it wasn't just that. I didn't meet his family. So let me be very, very clear. The mother 
is the example of the nurturing and the love that that man would have gotten to know how to treat a woman. She's the example to the woman that you've decided to be with, how she operates, how she communicates. The father is the example of what he's seen as headship, what he's seen as being a man and how he will um, behave and operate with women. I had not met his mother. Had I known that, I would have known she abandoned him. There was no mother. Had I met his father, I would have known that he beat women and was a drug addict and a drug abuser in front of his kids. Had I met any of his other family members, I would have put on my Nikes and I would have started hitting the road. I had done none of those things. So had I done in my vetting properly, and that's where the onus is on me, then I would have known this was not a man that was fit for a relationship at all. Okay, so when you figure out they're not fit for a relationship, how do you back up? <laughs> uh, you, you put on your brakes immediately. Listen, if you see that someone, had I known the things that I had known, I would have immediately told him that this is some place that we cannot go. We can probably be friends, but I don't feel that you are relationship material. I'm a very blunt, upfront person. I would okay. have had no problem communicating that to him. Um, not knowing those things, I walked myself into a world of trauma that was already there before I got there. And so once you do that, now you're stuck trying to figure out how to navigate stuff that you have nothing to do with, you wasn't a part of, you didn't break any of it, and you have no idea how to put it together. So once you see that this person has damage and they're not putting themselves in a place to be better, you have no other choice but to move on and go your own way. Once, once people figure out or decide that this person is abusive, because I know at some point it does advance to the place to where you know this is just not a good place to be or a safe place to be. Why do some victims often stay or why do they, some return once they leave? You know, a lot of that has to do with your culture and the community that you grow up in. If you grow up in a culture of abuse, then that's what you know, that's normal to you. If you grow up in a culture of um, dependency on men, or you want, if you're watching women be dependent on men or be, uh, or not self-sufficient, cannot manage themselves properly, that's what you learn. That's in your mind space. So a lot of it has to do with that. Also, a lot of women who are in domestic violence situations, um, the men have financially abused them. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have money. A lot of them don't have family members that they can go to. A lot of them don't want to go to shelters. So when you give yourself enough reasons why you don't and you can't move on, then you stagnate yourself to stay in a situation that's not livable. So uh, is it possible for abusers to change? I mean, it's possible that the sun will come out tomorrow. I mean, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's possible. Right? Anything is possible. But if I find out dating someone that you put your hands on a previous girlfriend or wife, there is no explanation. There is no story. There is <laughs> nothing that you can tell me that we will have date number two. It's about how much I value myself. So like I said before, had I known my ex-husband had beat his first wife, that was normal to him. And he was aggressive and abusive with the second wife. So I was just Tuesday. It just happens to be that I was the wife that decided I wasn't going to deal with it the longest. So I was out real quick. But it's about what you are willing to take and deal with. But I don't know. Listen, I figure anybody can do anything. You know, if you go get enough counseling, you realize what the problems are, you change your behavior and conduct, anything is possible. I believe anybody can get treatment and if you love yourself enough and you want to change, you can change. For me, that's not a bet that I'm going to take. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I'll make no Ranch, one, two, and, Ranch, one, two, and three, he's a little too busy, huh? <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm, I'm done. Peace out. Right. <laughs> so we often hear a lot about women as the actual victims of domestic violence. What about men and what do the percentages, how are the percentages as far as men and women? So I was doing some research into this. Let's be clear. The percentages okay. for men, of course, are a lot less. Right. But that's because men are not reporting that. 
And let's be clear what domestic violence looks like for a man because it oftentimes is not hitting because a man is often much, much muscular. Okay. We know that a man can handle a woman, can tackle a woman, can physically um, handle a woman in ways that we're not able to with men. But if you are in a relationship where a woman is talking down to you, emasculating you, humiliating you, denigrating you in front of people, that is not a loving relationship. That's an abusive relationship. She may not slap you, hit you, or kick you because she don't know what might be on the other side of that. But she's doing everything else to you but punch you physically. When I looked at the percentages of it, it was about 16% of men are reporting domestic violence if it's even that high at this point in time. It's embarrassing to men, but it happens. So do you think that it's on the rise in the pandemic? I know you read, a, there's a lot of information and a, um, a lot of articles throughout social media that talks about the increase and the rise of domestic violence during the pandemic. Um, have you seen that to be true? And what would some of the reasons be? Well, I think one of the things that they said is that there, there's less reporting. And I know, um, the uh, National uh, Domestic Violence um, Organization also listed that the reporting of domestic violence during COVID-19 has been significantly less. The uh, Center for Disease Control also did a study on it, says that it's significantly less. Well, here's the problem. People are getting laid off and your abuser is at home. So who do you report it to? How, how do you report it? People are at home now. And so you don't have the opportunities to get away. You don't have the opportunities to run away because where that person was at least gone from nine to five, they gave you an out, was maybe traveling and you didn't have to deal with it as much. COVID has made us, now we're in each other's face all the time. So now maybe when you were only getting, you know, maybe hit and disrespected when he come home, now you're getting it from the time he finished eating his eggs. It's going on all day long. And, all, and women who don't have a place to go, do not report. They just don't report. They live in it. So what about the LGBTQ community and their experience with domestic violence? Yeah, it's, I mean, listen, they're human beings. They're people. Your sexual choices, preference, whatever, it doesn't change you from being a human being. And if, if you are whatever your sexual orientation is, you're getting involved with someone with maybe who has trauma. What I have found to be, and um, the National Organization for Domestic Violence did state that they're having significant cha uh, challenges because a lot of them are already alienated from family. So now where you would normally be able to contact family because of their sexual orientation, family is no longer an option in some situations. And then there's that, well, I told you so, that goes along with your lifestyle, which we know it's not true. Anybody can be a victim of domestic violence, but now there's the extra layer of embarrassment and um, that comes along with that. So they're subjected to it just as much as anyone is because they're human beings and people are people. And people are people. Yeah. So if you suspect that a family member is in a domestic violent relationship or a neighbor or someone you, know, you come in contact with, what can you do to help? What can we do to help them? So this is where it gets tricky because we all want to help, right? Yes. We want to snatch somebody up real quick and shake them and say, what the? But now that's I'm... after you snatch the perpetrator after up. After you snatch oh, the perpetrator, right. that is correct. Right. We want to snatch the, the perpetrator first, right. Right. <laughs> right. That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to help in a real way. We do. Right. we do. But what we find that we do is that we bond them closer together. Ah. That's what we tend to do. See, here's the thing. Unless a person has in their mind that this situation is wrong, this situation is not beneficial, this is a dangerous situation, they don't see what you see. They choose not to see. And all they see, how many times have people heard the, well, you just don't like him. You just don't want me to be with him. Oh, well, you never liked her. Well, all those things may be right, <laughs> but we are all free moral agents and we have to allow people to make their decisions. What you can do is you can do an intervention and you can get that family member all the resources, therapists, telephone numbers, uh, support groups, and you can even offer to go with them to some of the support groups to support them. But until they wanna make a change, 
they will go back and forth until they are tired. And getting in the middle of it, a lot of times uh, does not help. It, it sometimes bonds them closer because keep in mind, he becomes the victim and she's already, or he's already conditioned in their mind that they have to help fix them and save them. Now you've just created the situation for them to help the victim. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So what steps can a victim of domestic violence take to prepare themselves to leave? They just, they realize that this is not where they need to be, yeah. that they're not safe there and they want to make a change. So what steps do they need to start to take to, to prepare themselves? Or do you just leave? What, what do you do? Listen, if you can just leave, that's fantastic. Um, I, I, I don't think that's probably the reality for a lot of women. So you need a plan. If you can't just abruptly leave, I would rather live in a shelter with a thousand people that I didn't know and take my chances than be with someone who says that he loves me and every time he turns around, he's got his fist in my face. I take my chance with a stranger because the Bible that I read said love don't hurt. So I don't know nothing about anything else anybody else is doing. But I would strongly suggest you create a plan for yourself. That plan is financial. Um, and let's be clear, any relationship that you're in, I don't care what anyone says, where your partner does not understand that that woman should have her own, it is okay to have her own bank account. I don't want to be beholding to anyone for anything. And if you make your own money, there's no reason why you should not have your own situation just in case. But prepare yourself for where, what your plan is going to be, what your financial situation is going to be. Are you going to start looking for a job? Where are you going to relocate? Get a support system that can help you because you know the person will start looking for you. You need a plan in place. The goal, let me keep in mind, let's keep in mind here, is not to be a domestic violence survivor and I have, I have nothing but respect for that term. But I tell people that I'm a domestic violence conqueror because let's be clear, this will never ever happen again, period, point blank. Your goal is not to survive. Surviving is existing. Your goal is to be done with this, learn from it, move forward, and, and excel to the next levels of what you are capable of being. That's the goal. So if they have difficulty uh, establishing a bank account because he has all of the money or however that works. Um, how do you start a bank account? Because they are going to have to have some money. Yeah. And may, that may be one of the reasons they stay longer too. You're right. And, and that can be easier said than done. I have a friend, she's an older friend and uh, she does work part-time and her and her husband has a joint bank account. He's very abusive. And I have made the recommendation to her to have her own bank account and set it up at a different address and a different location because you cannot, people who feel that you have no value, you cannot count on them. And he controls everything and anything and all things. But she is allowed a little trinket money. Well, take that trinket money and save it. You know, if you have, if you have a mother or brother or something, set up something at one of their addresses. And if you're allowed to have $20 for the month, then get take take ten dollars and put in that account. I, I don't want to downplay, and I don't want to make uh, anyone feel that they have to do anything. But it's very hard to do anything without any type of monetary support. And you have to start putting yourself on a road to be successful. And so you have to start being creative with those things. And so open up an online bank account. Nothing has to even come to you, and have it go someplace else. And put a little bit in there every time. And there's different organizations that'll help you relocate and help you find a place and help you do a restraining order. But you have to want to and be ready to do it. That's right. And there are a lot of bank accounts now online, and there are a lot of them that actually uh, give women uh, financial incentives mm -hmm. by opening them up online so that women can become uh, financially independent. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And having a place to go so do they just leave and go to the place or do they have to be referred how if i woke up and said you know no matter what i'm leaving now so what are my next steps well that's a part of having that plan right. but like i stated before there are domestic violence women's shelters for women with children that you can leave now it is not ideal I, I get that. 
and you don't want to leave the home that maybe you think that you built with someone for so many years, but it should never be at the cost of how much you love yourself and what your children are seeing. Your daughter will emulate your behavior because it's what she sees. Your son will be the man that he's allowed to see demonstrate this behavior and will act it out on another woman. So when you look at the bigger picture, inconveniencing yourself and going to a shelter where they have programs that'll help you, and they're not perfect. I am not advocating perfect. What I'm advocating is safety, love of self, and love of your children. That's what I'm advocating. So what steps can a victim of domestic violence um, take to explain to their family members. I'm in the shelter. You can't call them and let them know where I am because that's generally part of the problems too because as you said, the guy is going to come looking for them or the perpetrator is going to come looking for them. So right. what do you tell, how do you prepare your family for what has to happen? Because they, I'm, I mean, if you're still in a relationship at that this point, that perpetrator is pretty good at convincing you not to leave. So right. that perpetrator has got to be pretty good at convincing family and friends to tell you where you are, what to tell him where you are. Also, so what do you? How do you prepare your family? Of course, because they're chameleons, right? So they're gonna come mm -hmm. around your family and oh, I loved her, and I don't know why we can't get along, and I'm gonna do all these different things, right? But you already know who in your family you can and can't communicate with okay you already know this is no surprise so if you know that ain't bertha got a big mouth then we don't need to tell ain't bertha that we right. need to today because we already know he gonna know <laughs> I, would encourage, I would encourage you tell no one but one your mother or maybe someone that you know is a vault but i wouldn't spread that all around especially okay. if it's something that your life is at stake and this person is violent and you know they don't have to know what he or she is capable of you have to know then everyone in your family don't have to know they don't have to know where you are they just have to know that you're safe and that's it that's right it's your safety your your life is in your hands you don't put it in anybody else's hands so what you know is going to keep you safe that's what you do and what should we never say to a domestic violence victim um, I think we never should blame them. I think when you're, I, I know, when you're a domestic violence victim, you are embarrassed, you are humiliated. Um, and one thing, several things, but never ever blame them for it. Uh, well, you should, or well, why didn't you do this? Well, why you didn't just, if anything was that simple, we wouldn't need someone else coming along telling us. I had never been in a domestic violence situation. I was raised by my mother and four older brothers. And mind you, during this situation, my brothers knew nothing. I made sure they didn't know anything. They didn't see anything. When they was around us, we were a regular happy couple. Far from the truth. But I never gave way because I knew it was going to be a whole other situation that was going to go down. And I was not at a place yet to move forward. So I understood that. But what I certainly wouldn't have wanted anyone doing is telling me what I should and shouldn't do. Because all you're doing is replacing the person who's the abuser. Isn't that what they do? It's, it's a bully. It's a right. bully. It's, that bully. it's a form of bullying. Yes. It That's is. it. So you have to be careful how you communicate. Um, you don't have to lick the boo-boos. I say that all the time. Because I don't think that's beneficial to a domestic violence um, victim, survivor, conqueror. And when I give keynote addresses, I tell them all the time, I'm not going to come in here and wipe your tears. What I'm going to do is help you create a plan for yourself. And let's talk about we the signs we may not have seen that we now know are there. How do we make sure that we don't fall into that trap again? We have to have self-analyzation because the only way to prevent it again is to look into ourselves and see how we fell into it the first time. And then we talk about other different aspects. So I want them to be empowered and strong. I'm not going to sit there and cry with you. We, look, we've been doing that. Now let's do something else. Let's do something that works. <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, we just got a question that says, how do you break the cycle of domestic violence, which just ties into what you said about being one of the keys is to be self-analyzing. So how would you, what steps do you take to analyze yourself? Well, for how me, do you get people to own their own stuff? That's tough, right? Because mm -hmm. 
especially when you're in a situation where you're victimized, it is very easy, I promise you, to become the victim, live in the victim. He did this, this was all him. I tell people my ex-husband was a good 98% of every problem that we have. But how does that help me grow? What does that do for me? So now I have to see how my 2 to 10% played a part in what went on. So I immediately, for me, I went to therapy because I needed to not only understand how he could conduct himself in such a manner with such a wonderful, decent woman, <laughs> but, but I needed to understand how I walked into this, not being exposed to it. Self-analyzation will be your best friend because once you get to know you, it's the thing that's going to help you rise above it, move past him, excel past the situation. I have, have no feelings of anger, remorse, resentment, anything towards him. I don't love him. I don't hate him because I worked on me. It was not about what he did. It was what I walked into. And so once I worked on me, he's a non-factor. You work on you, then you help to create the, with the next generation how to love and honor and respect yourself. That's how you break the cycle and let them see you live in that truth. Hmm. That is powerful. Um, so we know that it is a domestic violence is a behavior that people see mm -hmm. and generally emulate growing up. Do you think it's an inherited behavior? Do you think it's genetically driven? You know, I like I stated, my ex-husband's father used to beat women. Okay. I don't think domestic violence is a, inherited because I also think there are people who have been victims of who've seen domestic violence, seen their mothers being beat, their fathers being beat, and didn't grow up to be domestic violence uh, abusers. So I think it's um, what I do find is that, and what during my research with not only NAMI but other different organizations is that people who are raised by domestic violence abusing parents are often um, abused themselves. And so was my ex-husband. He was beat. He was abused. So now he's got low self-esteem. He's got low confidence. He sees that the only way that you show love is by beating and abusing and hitting on a woman and, and, and knocking women up and all these different things. So that becomes his psychology of what a relationship is. The only person who could break that, if even possible, would be him. But, I, but when it's so ingrained in your your, the fiber of who you are and who you've been, that's hard for a person to break. But I, I don't yeah. think it's a DNA thing. I think it's um, the conduct and the behavior, what is seen and what becomes a level of normalcy for someone. So as, you know, it wouldn't be the U.S. if we didn't uh, find a lot of different terms for it. So, you know, some people call it domestic violence, spousal violence, intimate partner violence. What's the difference of any and all of these types of violence? Well, I think the world's changing, right? And so uh, we have domestic partnerships, we have marriages, we have people just living together. And so um, in some aspects, uh, just one terminology didn't work. So it has to, they have to use different terminology. It, that's only for the relationship standing. Domestic violence has been associated more so with married couples. And so now you have these different terminologies for live-in boyfriend and girlfriend, for same-sex relationships that are not married. That's all it is, a different terminology for the same uh, illness, basically. So for people who stay in the relationship, what, what are their coping strategies? You know, I don't know how you cope. I think um, you have to lose a lot of yourself uh, in a relationship where you are the peripheral punching bag for someone, either physically or mentally, right? Mm -hmm. You lose who you are because the goal of an abuser, the only goal is to make him or herself feel better by emotionally, physically, and verbally beating you down. How do you cope with being nothing every day? that has to be difficult. So over time you diminish. And the abuser is so smart that he realizes that he's training you. You don't know you're being trained, but you're being trained. And so after a while you don't go anywhere, you go in a corner like a puppy because that's what you've been trained to do. So how you cope with it, I think you go numb. Is that a sufficient way? That is not a sufficient way because no one should deal and cope with domestic violence. There's no, I couldn't give you any answer for that besides put on your Nike 
open up the door and figure it out the best way you can. And how do you find children reacting to domestic violence situations when they see uh, their parents actually in the middle of the violence? It's trauma. It is trauma. The majority of, especially in the black community, it is dealing with enough in certain areas where they, it has already been uh, shown and proven that violent areas bring out uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and children that are growing up in an environment where there's violence, there's drive-bys and different things of that nature. What's the difference if there's fighting, screaming, yelling, hollering, and beating and kicking inside of the house? It's still trauma. Trauma is trauma. With the the milita military go over to Afghanistan, they come back here, they have PTSD, and we're here locally at home, and we're 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 um, dealing with PTSD as if we've been in a war, but we brought the war home, or the war is in our community. Kids are not able to function, and one of the reasons my two children are not by my ex-husband, but I understood that my kids were looking at me, and I had one job. Every other job that I was doing was irrelevant, and that job was to get my kids and have a, the best life that they could possibly have without damaging them because they didn't go out and pick him i picked him and they shouldn't have to live with the the residue of a relationship that was bad from four days after we said i do and so i understood that and so it was important for me to get my kids out of a situation because i understood they were either going to emulate that behavior and think that that was normal or they were going to become numb to it. Either way, it's damaging. It's not okay. Trauma is trauma is trauma. So, and the, we know. I know that they don't just start. Gen generally, they don't. Generally, you just don't wake up and walk in and hi, this is wonderful, and then the abuse starts. So, what are some of the small signs that people need to start looking for? Because it starts small in a lot of cases. Because to do to get you to the point to where you are completely traumatized to even be yourself yeah that was that takes a while so what are some of the small signs that they I mean, you would be for? you would be shocked at how uh, a very short span the the level and the sophistication of the abuse has to deal with the abuser most abusers aren't that sophisticated so they don't know a lot of them don't make it a long drawn out game a lot of them need to get right to to the you know to the nitty gritty really quick because keep in mind a, an abuser feels bad about himself already and the way of hitting you is to make himself feel better that he's not this bad of a guy and i've got rain over this woman or i can manipulate this man or i can mistreat or i can talk down to you know that's why the bible says that the tongue is like a mighty sword it's it's powerful how you communicate with people so you have individuals that's a long drawn out process some of them it's not so much you know but what I noticed is that my ex-husband was always trying to tell me I was forgetting things. He was always playing mind games with me. And so uh, I couldn't do anything. This was wrong. That was wrong. I find that to be almost a consistent pattern with domestic violence abusers always picking at the victim. That's how it starts. Picking at how you look. Um, picking at um, you know, what you say, what you do. Um, I remember him telling me we were having a conversation and I was getting into the world of public speaking at the time. He knew I was a professional woman beforehand and he would tell me that I was talking to him like we were having a board meeting. Don't talk to me. You talk to me like this is a, a meeting. Now, I would think that what is wrong with how I communicate? It was just to have a problem with everything and anything about me. That's what I later got. It's, it's a problem with everything, the picking is where it starts, you know, and my process, look, you don't want someone or if the person doesn't work for you, move forward, but an abuser is trying to mold you. And so if he can get you to pick at yourself and be un uncomfortable and unsure of yourself, then he's right on the right track. Wow. Um, our next question is annually, how many deaths result from domestic violence approximately? You know, I do not know. I was looking at some statistics since COVID-19 from 27 and 2019, and it didn't give an approximate amount, but it did say that there were 25 additional from 2018 to 2019 from actual deaths from domestic violence victims. 
it didn't give me an exact amount. And I think because of COVID, it's a little difficult to kind of tell what's what is what is what, right? Right. Um, but let's be clear. You know when you're dealing with someone who is violent. And this is why I remember within the course of my marriage, I called the police nine times. I had no qualms about doing it. I figured if you act like an animal, you have to be caged. And I needed some help. That's what I did. I make no qualms about it. But here's the thing. The police tend not to get as involved with domestic violence because what? I called nine times. That means eight times I went back. At least. Okay. That's why they don't get involved. Okay. You know, and so you have to be very clear that when you're getting ready to make that change to move, that you're serious about it. Because every time we make phone calls and we don't carry through, we're making another woman or another man's plight less serious. Because they already know the house that I went to before, they've been doing this forever and she's not or he's not going anywhere. So people are dying. They are being murdered. They're accidentally being killed because maybe he threw you down the steps or punched you in your head too hard or broke your ribs or you've got internal bleeding. That stuff happens all the time. But no one's going to value you more than you. And I always tell people that um, we were created in God's image. And if you really believe that, then you know that we weren't put here on earth to be abused. We've got another question that says, have um, men felt less are men less de less decided uh when it comes to seeking help and fear of being ridiculed than women so do fewer men seek help than women and what percentage of abuse cases do you believe go unreported well the percentage was given that 16 percent of men are reporting domestic violence i believe there are absolutely, you have just as many women that grow up with trauma than men. Those women are getting into relationships. Who are they taking their trauma out on? Their kids and the men in their lives. But I think because uh, men are expected to be the headship, they're expected to be the breadwinners. That's the expectation that the world gives. They're expected to carry the heavy load that it is deemed not to be manly if you, uh, you know, if you don't allow a woman to talk to you any kind of way, or it's deemed not manly if you report this, this, that, and the other. What's not manly is allowing someone to disrespect you, and you are a grown person. What's not manly is allowing someone to take away the value and the honor that you have built up in yourself over all of these years because they can't get them right. Those are the things that would diminish you as a person, not filing a complaint. Because keep in mind, this person has been doing this for a long time. And women uh, hit and abuse men just as men abuse women. But like the, uh, the, the person that had the question, men don't report it. And so you stay and get abused and beat and kicked and, and all these. Absolutely not. I don't care who it is. You value yourself amongst over anyone. But it's, I believe that it has to be probably close to I don't know, I'm just giving you know a guess here, probably about 40%, because I have known men over years who have been in relationships that are very unhealthy, where the women are abusive, the women cheat on them, the women cuss them out, the women want to fight them, attack them. I, I definitely have heard of those type of situations. So, you know, trauma is trauma. <laughs> you don't have a gender to it. <laughs> <laughs> so you find percentages are higher among among black americans as opposed to white americans or hispanic americans you know i don't know i mean you know i don't know how you gauge that right so i haven't taken the poll but you know i, I there's a lot to be said about you know every different culture and every different race i know a marginalized um culture might tend to have more abuse because when you're being kicked around, you're not being given the opportunities, you're being treated as you're less than, there's something to be said about that. But then I also think there's something to be said about a race that has the hierarchy and um, feels that it's okay to abuse and diminish and disrespect and um, tend to have separate wives. So I don't know the statistics, but what I do know is that abuse comes in all shapes, forms, colors, sizes, and um, white, purple, green, yellow, black, brown, orange. I don't think it matters. Abuse is abuse and it's all disgusting. Let's back up to the uh, self-analyzing yourself. So for people who are listening now who uh, may find themselves or they're 
considering what we've discussed and possibly think that they're in a in a violent relationship or their cousins maybe you know people they work with okay right, <laughs> right. so what is one of the what one or two things could they start to do in that self analysis right now right um i always talk therapy i'm going to always talk therapy because therapy was the thing that um helped me to really come into my mental own. And I think if you are really gonna take a, a, a look at yourself, it has to be a deep look, not a shallow. Mm. And, and keep in mind, acknowledging that you play a part in anything does not diminish the role of the aggressor, the abuser, the person that took advantage. It doesn't take away, doesn't diminish, doesn't excuse. All it says is in order for me to move forward, I have to now acknowledge that I could have, should have done this in it better. And next time I will do this better. But in order for me to do that, I have to see how I made a left at Albuquerque. <laughs> That's what it does. And it, it helps to put you on the right track. And, and for me, a therapist had no dog in the fight. What is he doesn't care? if I'm, I'm, I'm good or not. His job is to listen and help direct me. He doesn't care about my ex, doesn't have a personal relationship with me, but it, it, they help, to, help you to ask yourself the questions that you need to grow. And they help to get you into a, the mind frame of having a growth mindset and being able to move forward and move onward and upward. So our next question is, can children be contributors in the abuse factor? Can children be contributors? Contributors and the abuse factor. Now, if the question is, can the children actually be abusers? Is that where? Uh, or cause someone to abuse you because they're children. You know, number one, no one causes anyone to do anything. Everything All right. is, That's is an right. educated choice. We are free moral agents. And so no one can make you do anything you have to have wiring already in your head um, that tells you that in order for me to be happy with myself, I have to make someone feel less. Children are children. They don't have the knowledge that we have. They don't have the growth that we have. They don't have the life experience that we have. Um, I have two children. They are teenagers now. Kids are uh, sneaky, <laughs> manipulative. <laughs> they are all those things, but they are those things on a child's level. For anyone to think a child on a child's level can manipulate an adult, there's a problem with that adult. Because if your mind is not larger than a kid's mind, then you got problems. That you should be able to see what you see and know that this is a kid being a kid and I'm going to go ahead and time them out, send them to their room or whatever the case might be. But a person that abuses is someone who feels bad about themselves. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're the person that was put in a victim situation. A child can't make anyone do anything. I don't care what they do. I don't care what they do. They're a kid. So what's your, what, how do you start your morning? What's your mantra? Do you have a particular meditation or prayer routine? How do you keep yourself centered uh, after having done the self-analysis? And so what do you do to shake the world off to make sure that you are not picking up those behaviors or tendencies to attract another abusive relationship? Well, let me tell you the first thing that I did. I didn't go rush into another relationship. How about that? All right. If you get out of a bad relationship and you go running into another relationship, you've got some pieces in you that really need some healing because the first thing you need to do is sit down and have a conversation with yourself and have a coming to Jesus on how you got into that relationship and now how to figure to make sure you don't get out of it again. So women especially have to stop jumping from one relationship to the other because you will not find what you need in that other relationship if you have not fixed your pieces. Mm -hmm. So when I got out of that relationship um, and went to therapy and did all the treatment, the last thing I thought about was dating. Matter of fact, I didn't want to see a man. Let me be real clear. <laughs> He was going to probably get put in the headlock. I'm just saying. <laughs> I needed to work on me. And I knew working on me was getting my public speaking career on, on, you know, on deck. Um, I wanted to get into mental health advocacy because I needed to understand how people processed how they processed and how he processed the way he did and how I could help other women 
to not fall into the trap that I did. So when I get up every day, I wake up with a smile on my face. I'm living my full potential. I'm living a happy, comfortable life. I don't have to worry about arguing with somebody because I said the sky was blue and his mind told him it was purple and now we're about to have a fight. I live in peace. But I live in peace because I create that peace. I create the environment that's around me and I don't allow anyone to take that away. So anyone that knows me will tell you that I laugh a lot. I'm, I'm silly. I didn't listen to music the whole time we were married. We didn't laugh the whole time we were married. And so now I'm back to the true form of who I am. And life is good. I tell you, I, I, I laugh, smile all day long. I have a good life. I've got one more question about um, children, actually. It's like, we see the commercials where teenagers are yelling at their parent, usually the mother, and it's causing her to panic. Is this domestic violence? Uh, listen, <laughs> let me be clear, because I wish my kids would. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here's what it is. It's definitely emotional abuse. It, and it could be said to be domestic violence. But here's the problem. As the parent, your job is to train and bring your children up in a way and they are to act, to operate, and to function. When did your child get the audacity to think that they could yell at you, disrespect you? At what point was that allowed? What did they see to think that that could happen? So here's one of those self-analyzation moments that we have to have with ourselves. Now, my child is disrespecting me, screaming at me, yelling at me. When did this start to happen where Johnny thought that he could buck up at me? What did he see? What did I, as a parent, allow my child, because this is what it's about, to be exposed to that my child thought that this is how you, um, you function with, with an adult. This is how you function with your mother. So you have to analyze where this behavior and conduct came from. And once now that you see it, you're acknowledging it. Now you need to get Johnny some help because this is not functioning behavior for a young man or a young woman to go out into the world and be productive screaming and yelling because someone in the world might scream and yell back, but in a different way. So you have to get that under control. That is so true because uh, we forget, as you say, we are free agents, but we are all free agents uh, operating in this world, trying to maneuver ourselves through. So, um, what are some deal breakers that happen when you're dating? <laughs> when should you get on your sneak sneakers and run? Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> deal breakers. Um, meet his mother or meet her mother and father and family structure. Meet the culture of the family. The culture is not the ethnicity. Okay. That's the ethnicity. The culture is how the family operates how they do things, how they get down. Are they a close family? You know, do they support each other? Do they support each other's bad conduct and bad behavior? See, that's the culture of the family. That's what you need to know. See, don't not know it. And then you get with the person and all of a sudden <laughs> you acted shocked and surprised when you saw what they was doing before. That's a part of her culture, what you thought she was going to do or he was going to do. Definitely look for the culture of the family how that person communicates. One thing that I don't like is um, them not doing anything wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. And you have to look for that. Because someone that can't accept and take personal responsibility and can't own up to his own mistakes, all he's going to do is turn that, he or she will turn that on you. So it's very important that you see that. And set boundaries. I set boundaries and kept letting him inch them away before you know it, you couldn't even see the line. Setting up boundaries is important. Boundaries, you have them in everything. How you deal with your siblings, how you deal with your mother. You think you don't have them with relationships? You know, even if the boundaries, I don't have sex before 90 days. Well, if 60 days he's pressuring you, now he's telling you I have no respect for you because you gave me a guideline and I care so little about you that I'm trying to get you to break it. It's small things like that, but a really bigger thing and a part of the bigger picture. So meet the family. I used to always say, uh, meet the ex-wives and lovers, too, because <laughs> they have stories they're not telling. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, so remember, we've got to meet the families because the mother 
demonstrates the amount of love that happens in that family and the father is teaching how to be a man so you've right. got to meet them and you've got to figure out what that dynamic is or at least see it up close right uh, set boundaries for yourself and don't allow anyone to move you past your boundaries because that is a sign of not being respectful of who you are that's right and always be leery or run really fast if everything that ever happens wrong what it was wrong and not is your fault so right. uh, that's right so keep your sneakers handy <laughs> keep them on last step and over your shoulders <laughs> that's what I'm just saying. not just handy last step and over your shoulders you never right. know you never right. know so um i think we've gotten all of the questions uh that were asked through the facebook group i want to thank everyone for listening and watching us tonight and being very interactive with your questions. Uh, this is a very important topic to me and to, I think, to everyone, because you never know when you may find yourself in a situation like this. And sometimes when you do, it is not as simple as getting up and just walking out. You have to do that early. So we want you to, to find the signs, uh, to know the signs of that. So tell us a little bit about your speaking uh, business. We've got a couple of minutes left. So tell us a little bit about your speaking. Absolutely. So I do keynote addresses, seminars, and conferences. Um, I help to coach people on public speaking. I actually have speaking and debate workshops. And I also do speaking uh, and debate coaching for children as well. Um, I'm also an influential storyteller. So I uh, coach on how to disseminate your message to the audience, how to make sure that whatever story or communication that you want to get to the audience, it's captivating them and that they don't have to see it to imagine and envision it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, domestic violence, um, also civic, civil issues, and um, just an assortment of topics mm -hmm. that I've become very knowledgeable about and um, that I share. Fantastic. You have one last question. There's always that one last when you say right. we're about to end. It's like um, um, they're asking if a, uh, what about a child that abuses animals? Is he more likely to grow up to do this with his wife? Okay, that is a question mark. Um, there has been something said and research done that um, that's an early sign of something. I was I would strongly suggest that you start getting the child a psychologist because um, distributing pain. Children are usually very empathetic at an early age. When they're comfortable with hurt and distributing pain, then there's a cut off of that emotional uh, connection that a child should have for another living thing. I would strongly encourage getting them to a therapist to see if maybe you can kind of get that back in alignment for um, their empathy and, and how they're operating. But yeah, seek some help for that. Okay, okay. so whoever asked that question, seek some help for that um, as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. Because we do know that the sooner we address these issues, the better it is and the easier it is to get them corrected before they get really hardened and it becomes uh, a source of pleasure for them. So we, Absolutely. we don't want them to do that. Absolutely. Oh, so what one little tidbit of wisdom. We've got one minute left before we sign off. You know, you have to make sure that you take your life into your own hands. And domestic violence is never okay. Yelling, screaming, hollering, abuse is never okay. Love yourself enough. If you're a man, if you're a woman, make sure you have a good support group. There are confidential support groups. Love yourself enough to love yourself and never hold yourself accountable for anybody else's actions. You are made in God's image. That's to be excellent and wonderful, not to be abused and denigrated. Thank you very much. Tamari, um, uh, we'll get an answer to this last question uh, in the chat. So I think we covered it earlier. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, for sharing all of this and sharing your personal story because it's always the personal story that helps other people, I believe, move forward toward discovering who they are and to know that they're worth every bit of effort that it takes to, to just get rid of anything that is holding you back because we are all precious. So with that, I want you to be inspired into further notice. I want you to celebrate everything. Do not go gently into that good night. I want you to find a heal worth dying for and take it and be the person you have been waiting for. Make today so awesome that yesterday gets jealous and above all else, I want you to do it your way. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor. And remember, life is too short to drink cheap champagne. 
thank you very much. You guys have a great evening. To drink cheap champagne So I decided to buy me